Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're continuing with our Trivi Let's Talk Lore series. Last episode, we left off with Guan Yu demanding to know why he was not given any assignments. To this, Zhuge Liang chuckles and answers, I originally wanted to give you the most important role, but then I thought about your past relationship with Cao Cao, and thought perhaps it's best that you wait at home with us, as you will only let him escape. Guan Yu retorts, that even though Cao Cao treated me well when I was in his camp, I have more than repaid my debt by helping him slay Yan Liang and Wen Chou. If I see him again, he will only be an enemy, and I will not go easy on him. Zhuge Liang replies, Okay, I'll let you go, only if you leave a military oath here that swears on your life that you will not let him escape. Guan Yu agrees and asks, What if he doesn't come on the route that you sent me to? Zhuge Liang replies that I will also leave a military oath here on my life that I promise you that Cao Cao will try to escape through the route that I'm sending you on. So Zhuge Liang sends Guan Yu towards a narrow mountain path called Huarong Dao and orders him to light a fire throughout the pass to confuse Cao Cao. Guan Yu questions that these fires would tip off Cao Cao that there would be an ambush ahead. Zhuge Liang nods but replies, Cao Cao is a suspicious character, so the more obvious the ambush, the more likely he will fall for it. So Guan Yu takes Guan Ping and Zhou Cang along with 500 axemen and heads towards Huarong Dao to await for Cao Cao's arrival. After Guan Yu left, Liu Bei asked Zhuge Liang, My brother is honorable to a fault. If Cao Cao really tries to escape through Huarong Dao, then I think Guan Yu would just let him go based on their past relationship. Zhuge Liang replies, I have studied the stars. Cao Cao's life is not at an end yet. So I decided that we should give the mission to Guan Yu. So at least Cao Cao ends up owing him a favor. With both Liu Bei and Zhou Yu's army mobilized, let's see what's happening in Cao Cao's camp. The changing of the wind did not go unnoticed by Cao Cao and his generals, a strategist Cheng Yu warned Cao Cao again of the dangers of a fire attack. But Cao Cao waves him off and says, A breeze of east wind is only natural, and there is no need to worry about it. Soon, a messenger arrives and reports that Huang Gai has finally found a chance to come surrender, as there will be a food delivery from Puyang sailing down today. Huang Gai says he will slay the transporting general and surrender alongside with all the supply ships tonight in sometime between 9 and 11 o'clock. Hearing this, Cao Cao becomes overjoyed as he has been eagerly awaiting for Huang Gai's arrival for some time. Back in Zhou Yu's camp, as Huang Gai prepared to depart, Zhou Yu asked the guards to tie up and bring forth Cai He who is still remaining at camp. Cai He sees Zhou Yu and immediately screams, I'm innocent. Zhou Yu replies, you're clearly a spy who has faked a surrender. Now Huang Gai is about to set sail to start this war. I'm going to bar your head right here and blood to sacrifice to the gods to bid us good fortune in the war ahead. Cai He screams and tries to throw Gan Ning and Kan Ze under the bus and claim that they are both going to betray Zhou Yu. Zhou Yu laughs and tells him that he told them to play along as Cai He's head fell. Zhou Yu drenched their banners in Cai He's blood and bid Huang Gai save travels. Huang Gai then set sail for Cao Cao's camp. At the time, Cao Cao stood on his command ship in the middle of the water encampment as he looked east, eagerly awaiting for Huang Gai's arrival. Soon, Huang Gai's ship appeared on the horizon, but after looking at the ships for a while, strategist Cheng Yu approached Cao Cao and says, Something is off. If these were supply ships carrying food like Huang Gai had said in the letter, their hulls should be deeper in the water. From the look of things, these ships are just too light to be carrying food. With the east wind soaring, we must be careful. Cao Cao quickly orders Wen Ping to sail out with 10 small scout boats to try to halt the advance of these advancing ships. Wen Ping sails out towards Huang Gai's ships and yell, The Prime Minister asks that you guys anchor in the center of the river and await for farther instructions. But just as he spoke, Arrows flew out from Huang Gai's ship, and Wen Ping took an arrow into his left arm as he fell back into the hull of his ship. Soon, Huang Gai's ship 
breezed past these small scout vehicles and inched ever closer to Cao Cao's main water encampment. Huang Gai then ordered all the ships to light themselves up on fire as these 20 flaming ships rammed full speed into Cao Cao's water encampment and locked themselves onto these massive linked ship platforms that are docked within. Immediately, hundreds of ships littered the horizon as four naval battalions each with their own fire ships also appeared from the horizon as they all headed straight for Cao Cao's camp. Leading the way, Huang Gai jumped off his ship and charged through Cao Cao's encampment as he headed straight for Cao Cao's command ship, which was already docked in the water encampment and already on fire as well. At this dangerous time, Zhang Liao ferried a small craft and approached Cao Cao's command ship to try to escort Cao Cao to safety of the land camp. But before they could get far, Huang Gai was already closing in, so Zhang Liao took out his bow and fired an arrow right at Huang Gai, who could not see or hear the shot as the fire raged all around him. The arrow struck Huang Gai right in his shoulder as he rolled over and fell into the water. Luckily, Han Dang's ship were nearby as Han Dang rescued Huang Gai and ordered his men to escort Huang Gai back to camp. This gave Tao Tao the time to escape under the protection of Zhang Liao as they managed to make their way back on land. But for his men left out on the water encampment, fire engulfed them as Han Dang and Jiang Qing cut off the left flank and Zhou Tai and Chen Wu cut off the right flank. With the central force of Zhou Yu and Chen Pu's men coming in from the middle of the camp, they flushed the water encampment clean as tens of thousands of Cao Cao's men died in this initial attack. Back on land, Gan Ning's unit, which had been marching towards Cao Cao's camp in Wuling, had finally made it there. And immediately, Gan Ning thrusted his blade into Cai Zhong's back as he ordered his men to start setting fires throughout the forest of Wuling around Cao Cao's camp. Seeing Gan Ning has started his attack, Lu Meng, who trailed behind Gan Ning, also charged up to Cao Cao's land encampment and started setting fires everywhere as well. As Cao Cao and Zhang Liao traversed through this burning forest, they could see Dong Xi and Pan Zhang's men approaching from the north, so they were forced to turn west and soon ran into their own generals Mao Jie and the injured Wen Ping, along with 10 riders who joined their ranks. They were not so lucky with the next group they met as they bumped right into Lu Meng's main forces. Zhang Liao took a few riders to hold off Lu Meng as Cao Cao continued his escape, but he was soon met by Lin Tong's force closing in from the west. At this critical moment, Xu Huang and his forces found Cao Cao and started engaging with Lin Tong to buy Cao Cao time to escape. After some chaotic fighting, Cao Cao and his men managed to break free and escape. But soon, another army approached them. This time, they were in luck as led by Ma Ting and Zhang Yi, who are surrender generals who used to work for Yuan Shao. Along with them were 3,000 cavalry on reserve duties, who has come to reinforce as they noticed the start of the fire. With the infusion of this armed group, Cao Cao becomes much more confident as he sent out these two generals with a thousand men to scout up ahead as he kept the 2,000 other cavalry with him as guards. Unfortunately for these two generals sent ahead as scouts, they soon bumped into Gan Ning's main force, and after a duel with Gan Ning, both of these generals lie lifelessly on the ground. Seeing that fighting has erupted ahead, Cao Cao quickly just turned east as he was hoping for reinforcement from Hefei would arrive. But Zhou Yu had already thought of this and ordered Tai Shi Ci to cut off that route. So instead, Cao Cao turns farther west, and luckily, they bump into Zhang He's force, who Cao Cao now sends to be their rear guard. As they travel farther west within Wuling, it's already 4 a.m., and they've been fighting for over 7 hours in the chaos of the night. Everyone's tired and deflated from the defeat, but all of a sudden, Cao Cao burst into laughter. Everyone turns to Cao Cao and asks the Prime Minister, why is he suddenly laughing? Cao Cao answers, I am laughing at how inept Zhou Yu and Zhuge Liang are. If I were them, I would have planned an army here to ambush us. But before he could finish, drums sounded all around them as Zhao Yun charged in, triggering his ambush. Zhao Yun charged out screaming, Our chief strategist Zhuge Liang has asked me to lay waiting for you here for a long time. Cao Cao quickly orders Zhang He and Xu Huang to double-team Zhao Yun as the rest of their men try to rush for escape. 
Knowing that Zhang Fei is up ahead, Zhao Yun does not give chase and only focus on seizing military supplies and stranglers. As Cao Cao escaped farther west, the sun began to rise, but along it came a sudden shower that drenched everyone's armor. As it was late November, the morning air was extremely cold and everyone was starting to get hungry. As they desperately searched for food, an army approached from their rear. Luckily, once again it's a friendly army. It's the entire guard battalion of Li Dian and Xu Chu, who had been guarding all the strategists, and now they're all safely here together. Along with them were also some supplies, so Cao Cao ordered them to rest as they killed off some of their horses to cook as food. Everyone also took off their armors to dry next to the fire, and the mood finally turned bright after a long night of fighting and running. As they ate, Cao Cao once again bursted into laughter. Everyone turned to Cao Cao again and says, Last time you laughed at Zhou Yu and Zhuge Liang, and then Zhao Yun showed up. What is the prime minister laughing at this time? Cao Cao explains, I'm still laughing at Zhou Yu and Zhuge Liang, for if I were them, I would have put an army in ambush here. Once again, just as Cao Cao finished his sentence, drums roared and Zhang Fei charged out with his ambush. Immediately, Xu Chu rode up to fend off Zhang Fei as everyone else tried to run. But seeing Xu Chu was having trouble, Xu Huang and Zhang Liao joined in to triple team Zhang Fei as Cao Cao and the rest of the men secured their escape. By the time they escaped out of Zhang Fei's ambush, there were not many men remaining. Many of those who are still there are now either injured or armorless because they left their armor to dry. To make matters worse, even many of the generals now no longer had their horses and are now on foot. Soon, they approached a fork in the road. Some of the Jin province troops, who are locals, explained to Cao Cao, The road on the left is the main road. It's flatter and wider and easier to go, but it's a much longer route. The right route leads to a mountain pass called Huarongdao. There is only a rough hiking trail there, so the travel will be tougher, but the distance is much closer. In order to get a better decision, Cao Cao ordered some of the scouts to climb a nearby hill to get a better view of these two paths. The scouts reported back that the main road seems very quiet, while the small hiking trail has fire and smoke rising from it. With this information, Cao Cao decides, let's go through the small trail as the smoke and fire is clearly just a trap to lure us onto the main road where the real ambush is. So Cao Cao's group of less than 300 men pushed on towards Huarongdao, but the hiking path was extremely damaged and muddled from the morning rain, so many of their horses got stuck or injured. As Zhang Fei's forces were still looming behind them, Cao Cao ordered to abandon the injured, and soon the trail was filled with the cries of those who got left behind. When they finally got into a clearing in front of Huarongdao itself, Cao Cao laughed once again, and everyone becomes scared as they ask Cao Cao again, why is he laughing, as the last two times didn't bode well for them. Cao Cao says, if I were Zhou Yu or Zhuge Liang, then I would have placed an ambush here, for we would have surely perished here. Immediately, drums sound and Guan Yu rides out atop of the red hair with the green dragon crescent blade in hand and come along 500 axe men lined up blocking the pass. Cao Cao orders his general to stand and fight to the last breath, but this time everyone was already at their last breath. Fortunately, Cheng Yu stepped out and suggested, Guan Yu has always had a soft heart. If we resist, we will get killed. Our best chance is if we beg and plead then perhaps he can remind himself of all the good times he spent together with us. So Cao Cao rides up and chats with Guan Yu as he reminded him of the time they spent together. Guan Yu replies, I have promised Zhuge Liang to bring you back, so I can't let you go. Plus, I have more than repaid your kindness by killing Yan Liang and Wen Chou. To this, Cao Cao replies, But what about the times you killed six of my generals as you left me? I never blamed you for any of that so perhaps you can turn a blind eye and spare me this one time. Guan Yu, who felt a bit guilty of how he cut his way through the five passes when he left Cao Cao, finally relents as he drops his blade and orders his men to open the pass for Cao Cao to cross. As Cao Cao's men flooded through the pass, Guan Yu is struggling internally, and he lets out a roar. Fearing that Guan Yu has changed his mind, all of Cao Cao's men bow down and Guan Yu, Seeing his old friend Zhang Liao among the crowd, 
finally relents as he withdrew his men and left to let Cao Cao return to Nanjun, where Cao Ren was stationed. With Cao Cao's defeat and escape at the Battle of Chibi, we have now concluded part two of our Chibi Let's Talk lore trilogy. Tomorrow, we'll do our historical episode before returning for part three, as we will explore how Liu Bei and Sun Quan will now divide up the spoils from winning this war and return to the battle of wits between Zhuge Liang and Zhou Yu. So see you next time. Bye.